diversified semantic layer. I think this is what they refer to as a visible layer. Um, this is my first, and I um, feel quite lost without um, the founder, Eric Vallow, or Josh Fletcher, any one of these, but I'm joined today by fellow SAP mentor, Ethan. Ethan, good afternoon for you. Good evening for me. Hi, Clint. Good evening. So what we're going to try to do today is um, play with two technologies that are close to both our hearts, but on a separate side of the spectrum is um, from the recently, I think probably about two, three months back, SAP released the functionality of Nearline Storage into CyberSIQ from BW. Um, Ethan, this is what, it's about three months ago this, this became sort of GA? Yeah, I think that's about right. Um, it, it's been kind of in the works for quite a while now and, and um, just came onto the, onto the market uh, in general availability a few months ago. And, okay. uh, so, so this yeah, is this pretty is pretty exciting. Hot off the press. Um, myself being in the Cybers IQ world, and all those who listen to the podcast know me know that Cybers IQ mentioned probably more than my children. But anyway, I've I've been exposed to the Nearline storage component for probably about three or four years. There was a SAP partner company called PBS who wrote this component, and since SAP acquired uh, Cybers, what's well, probably coming on two and a half years ago, they've now made it part of BW. So what I'm going to do is just um, share my screen here and hopefully show everybody very, very basically um, what, hopefully you can see that. Can you see that, Ethan? Yes. Okay, right there now. So, so you know, I'm not a BW person, and Ethan will probably talk you through this, but that application layer that, that we see there is what we can assume to be BW. And underneath, I've just used MaxDB as an example for a sort of a sample database, but in, in our instance, we're using SQL Server, but typically, in most installations, that could be DB2, Oracle, um, MaxDB, obviously HANA, but we won't go there yet. Now, you can see a little arrow out on the right to Cybase IQ, and what Nearline Storage does is it pretty much takes your cold data or your non-read, your sort of read-only data, and archives it into Cybase IQ. Um, you're going to get the benefits of that, and that's hopefully what we're going to try to show you. You're going to get the speed of IQ, you're going to get the compression ratios and all those other good things. What it's also going to do is going to shrink the size of your your, your sort of hot data, your, your data and in this max DB in this space, which obviously the, you know, the smaller the data set there, the, the faster your queries are going to run. Um, the key for me is that from, from, from the end user, I know we've got an iPad there, which is probably a bit adventurous from the BW point of view, but the key is, is that it's seamless to the end user of where the data is. So it's, it's, archived, it's archived across by the NLS engine within BW, but the end user just puts in, he wants to see a report, or he or she wants to see a report for a year, and the application tier in BW handles where data is stored, federates it, and brings it back up to the end user. Ethan, I hope I didn't hack that too badly. That's exactly right. So the, <laughs> the nice thing about NLS with BW is that it will it will bring together data that's in your nearline storage and hotter data that's currently in your BW objects um, and still on the BW MaxDB database. So it's really it's kind of like database federation, um, but it's but it's done in a way that's completely managed by BW. So um, it doesn't have as much flexibility as Federation, but it results in some of the same advantages. And, you know, for me, coming from the enterprise, everywhere else, well, the flexibility of Federation adds heaps of complexity. <laughs> so, you know, I, I, I think this is a, a wonderful solution for, for, for the BW folks. And, I mean, I think another thing, just to, you know, before we get into the tech deep dive is, you know, I always say this to customers, if you're running SAP or you'll be running harder in the future, whether you like it or not, it's just, this is my opinion that that's where SAP are going and you will be running it. But with this nearline storage, what it does, it lets you really shrink that database size sitting underlying your hot data, as we can call it. Um, and you can take, you know, if you get terabyte environments, you can take the terabytes into IQ, still get good performance, which means your honor investment will be a lot smaller than it would have been if you needed to put your whole BW system there. Yeah, I mean, this gives another option on top Which of... Which I think is quite compelling. Yeah, definitely. And, and this gives another option on top of some of the, the HANA native features now, like um, like getting data that kick, that's, that's kept out of memory by default. Um, so you have some of those HANA capabilities around, around the HANA tables that's com completely native within HANA. Um, and then you have something like this, where um, you can have a BW-managed nearline storage um, archive that that has a different set of features around performance and around um, cost of data storage, essentially. So 
Should we get Should we get to it? For those who know anything about me, you know I'm cursed with bandwidth. And uh, Ethan and I were having a conversation quite separately for about two minutes before we realized that the beloved telecom. If you hear me, telecom, if you see me, please sort out your brand for bread. <laughs> anyway, enough about my bandwidth issues. Uh, Ethan, let's go for it. I think we're going to dive deep into the techie stuff so you can see what's going on. Yep, I think that's the idea. So um, we're going to just show what we did as far as as far as far uh, setting up NLS for BW and for, on the Sybase side. And I'll just go first. I'm showing what I did on the BW side. Um, it's pretty straightforward on, on both sides, it seems like. So let's just we'll link. The, there's a good PDF that's available on SCN that we'll link from the um, from the notes in the in the post, um, and we'll just reference that really briefly here. So I'm going to do a screen share, and we will get we will get started. Um, it keeps trying to. Google Hangouts is not quite up to snuff here, but all right. Oh, beautiful. So um, we've got, in order to set up um, the new line storage for BW, what you basically do is you set up a secondary database connection for BW. So BW is based on the NetWeaver platform. Um, Josh Fletcher and I did a, a whole series about how BW works um, from a kind of beginner's perspective, from a business object user's perspective. Um, BW runs on the NetWeaver platform, and it is, among other things, a database abstraction layer. So BW runs on a primary database. In, jo in Clint's slides, they were it was MaxDB. Um, and we're going to set up a secondary database connection so that BW can access a secondary database. Um, that is actually installing the necessary drivers um, in the SAP kernel, which is as simple as getting the right files and copying them to the right place on the system. So that's the first thing we did, um, or that I did on the BW side. Um, it's pretty fast, um, pretty straightforward. The, um, the next thing you have to do, unfortunately, is install all the patches that are required. Um, as Clint mentioned, this is a pretty new solution. Um, it started out with it being available um, in Service Pack. Nine, I believe, of BW 7.3, um, and and um, whenever there's a first release of a new functionality, um, even when it's general availability, there are often some fixes that are required. So it goes general availability once the fixes are available, but that doesn't mean that they're available in the form of a support package. So the fixes that just I to, installed, just, sorry, sorry, just to hop in there, but somewhere in the PDF there was a link to all the notes. Remember that we only found when we were sort of trying to get the connectivity working, is that right? Exactly, yeah. And th that's here, actually, in this in this part of the PDF. I think you can see it on my screen. Um, hopefully, yes. Um, yeah, so that's, that's in this PDF on page 40. It's a link to several notes. And I would recommend searching um, based on the instructions it gives in the PDF for additional ones. Um, so I installed about probably 20 notes um, that are fixes on top of support pack 9. Um, to the to the NLS functionality. Some of it is simply performance. Some of it is actually are actually bugs that just make it not work in certain scenarios. So those all got installed. Um, then all you have to do is configure a secondary database, and that's as simple as going to uh, transaction code DBC and um, going into edit mode and creating a new entry. And we've already got an entry that exists, but the entry needs to look like this. Um, the DBMS is Sybase. Um, ASE and IQ actually use the same set of drivers. Um, and so it, the system doesn't really care if you're using Sybase IB, I, ASE or Sybase IQ. Um, but obviously, for analytic applications, IQ is going to be um, perform superior from a performance perspective and from a compression perspective. Um, and you have to provide just connections. Just a quick yep. heads up. Sorry. Um, you often find the ASA, which is Adaptive Server Anywhere drivers as well, that does work, but mm -hmm. it's, 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 it's a lot slower. So you will connect, you will be able to, but just your performance is shocking. So try and <laughs> avoid using those. Mm -hmm. um, you know, yeah. Just to get it works, great, but rather go for the IQ ones. Yeah, I, I don't know anything about the IQs, about the Sybase side, really, so, uh, so it's 
it's cool to work with somebody like Clint who knows all the ins and outs um, of what we need to avoid and what we can actually do. Um, and so you then provide the connection for a string, which this is all really clearly laid out in the PDF. Um, so that sets up our secondary database connection. Um, what we have to do next is, on top of that secondary database connection, um, you tend to want to test it first, and there's a, there's a program, um, an ABAP program that will test it for you. And then we would set up a nearline storage connection. And there are a few ways to do that, but the easiest way is to go to the primary VW transaction code RSA1, um, go down to administration, go down to current settings, and then nearline storage connections. And that just brings up the configuration table for our nearline storage. Um, and basically, what you all you have to do is um, is just specify this class name and the connection parameter where this is the name of the connection that we created in DBCO in the previous screen that we were looking at. Um, once you do that, save it, test it. Um, you'll see this you'll see, hopefully, a green status come up here. Um, and a lot of log messages that are all green and tell you a lot of stuff about the way that your Sybase system is configured. Um, and then you're in business, basically. So then there's the stuff you actually have to do on your BW object that you're going to that you're going to store in nearline storage. And just let's go through that really, really quickly. Um, We've got a couple of different objects here that we'll get back into in a second after Clint explains what he did on the Sybase side. But when you are going to store an object in nearline storage, um, you want to first just right-click on the object, either in InfoCube or in DSO. Um, then you need to create a data archiving process. And then you'll specify, we don't necessarily need to use ADK-based archiving, but you'll specify a nearline storage connection, BWN NLS, which is the connection we just created. You can test it, and you get this connection, same, the same screen as before, that shows everything is good. Um, and then you need to specify a selection profile, which is the partitioning characteristic that you're going to store by. Um, so usually that'll be a time slice. Um, in our case, we're using year. Um, sometimes it'll be, sometimes it'll be something else like a document number. Um, and you can choose whether or not to allow archiving of non-compressed data. That's only for cubes. Info cubes. Um, you can set up semantic grouping, and then you have your you have some parameters around your nearline storage connection, specifically the size of the data packages it creates in the nearline storage database. And that's it. Then you save, activate, and you've got your data archiving process set up. Um, we're not going to do that here because we don't actually want nearline storage on the cube. Once you have near, once you have your data archiving process set up. The menu changes when you right-click on the object. We've just moved to the DSO because that's where the nearline storage is already set up. Um, and you can display it, change it, or delete it. But if you actually want to store something in nearline storage, you go to Manage. So this little icon here on the right shows that you're ready to go. You, you, you go to Manage. And then you go to the Archiving tab, which wasn't there before. And then you can create an archiving request where you specify data to archive either by how old the data is or by your partitioning characteristic that you specified before. And that's it. Um, you hit archive in the background, and it will go through the process of archiving your data in your line storage um, database that you're using. So uh, let's switch back to you, Clint, and take a look at the Sybase side. Sure. Just a just a quick um, BW new question. Would you? I know in this example we've only uh, archived the DSO. W would you? Would you also maybe set this up from an info info queue point of view, or would sure. that not logically work? Work. No, absolutely. It works on DSOs. It works on info queues. Um, I think we'll talk about this a little bit more later about some of the reasons you might yeah. want to switch to nearline storage with Sybase IQ. Um, but as we'll see when we run our queries, um, the the performance that we'll get with nearline storage on IQ and the DSO is actually superior to what we what we saw with the cube um, running on the BW native SQL server database. 
Um, so there are some advantages to newline storage in DSOs. Um, in fact, you might even be able to switch to using DSOs as your reporting solution. But in either case, it will get data out of the VW system and into your newline storage system, and so allows you to manage your VW database size um, more effectively. Okay, because you, you're not going to have the duplicate storing of DSO info queues on both sides. Just keep DSOs archived across and do the reporting of that for performance. Yeah, theoretically, you could do that a lot like the way that with a VW on HANA system, we often will get rid of info cubes and just do reporting directly on DSOs. Both yeah. HANA and IQ are columnar analytic databases. Um, HANA also supports a row-based concept, but, in, in, but as far as VW objects, they're columnar. And so um, reporting on a DSO-like object, which is like a flat table-like object in a columnar database, is going to have performance as good as reporting on a cube object in a columnar database because under the covers, BW structures them very, very similarly on HANA and IQ. They both end up being essentially flat tables. Okay, great. Let's uh, hop across to... Yeah, just so, um, just from a technology point of view, we do all of this on Amazon S. Um, yeah, it was quite interesting getting, making sure that the boxes were in the same zone so we could try to get it as the lowest latency as possible. Yeah, and it ended up being pretty pretty impressive in the Singapore region. I think they must not have too many racks of servers out there. But. <laughs> zone B was the, the golden zone we went for. But, you know, from, from my side, the IQ, I mean, once the database was installed, um, I'm doing this on Windows. So, so pretty much out of the PDF, it was really, really simple. Um, there's just some sort of public options that you can set that are specified. I mean, these do, these do vary based on your server size, but if, you, if you're going vanilla and you don't really know IQ, then don't really worry about them. I've just pulled them out all into this text file. From us, we just created a sort of a temp and a, a main DB, step, DB space for the NLS over there. And then the last thing was um, the user, just create a specific user for in your last storage. You know, I suppose this is from a DBA perspective, best practice so you know who's hammering the box um, and who's not. And that's really sort of, the, you know, the SQL I'm highlighting is all you really have to set up from the IQ point of view. Uh, me personally, I spent probably five minutes on that and about two hours trying to get our two servers to talk based on firewall options, both from the EC2 and Windows. So most of the effort was spent actually getting the boxes to talk, and that's probably for my um, very amateur networking skills rather than anything else. Uh, I think both, both of us were quite surprised when we... Uh, Wired the boxes together and it just started dramatically. So it was it was, it was pretty cool. I thought. Yeah, it was, I was very impressed by how um, by the fact that it basically just worked, um, and I thought I, I thought that was very nice. I mean, I we haven't run I think into any bugs in the actual um, newline storage functionality on the VW side using IQ. Um, we haven't exercised it a lot uh, yet, but um, but. It seems fairly solid um, for basic functionality at this point in time, and it definitely it worked on the first try, um, and and I think that's pretty impressive. I and mean, we applied all those notes that I talked about, um, so I'm hoping that once SP10 comes out, um, that will be a really solid support pack for getting started. When are they looking? What what what's the dates looking like on that on that sort of? I do not know. 10. It should be pretty soon. Okay. Um, all the fixes okay. that we applied now are are available to any customer. Okay. Um, for sure. So, so, so should I just um, quickly hop back onto IQ and show which objects were created? That would um, be and then you can, okay, cool. let me go back in. So uh, just to refresh, um, we on the BW side, we showed that the DSO got archived. And what we did actually was we archived the entire DSO um, on Neuroline storage, everything. So that's not necessarily going to be a normal um, approach and because when you, once you put some, a partition into the Neuroline storage archive, um, you actually aren't allowed to update that partition anymore. So you have to only put things in right now that are, that are read-only, that you're done with. Um, hopefully in the future, it looks like on the VW roadmap, there is a plan to allow updating of partitions. And so that'll be really powerful once that happens. Um, and so what we did was we did two archiving requests. We did one that was based on calendar years 1987, I think, to 1990. Um, so we did four years there, and that was about 16 million records. Um, and then we did another yeah. one based on years 1990 to 1998, um, and that was another uh, like 35 million or something. Clint can do the count on IQ. 
Um, yep. And those, I mean, that was, it was running, it was doing about 10 million records per hour. And so I think we're not really dealing with a very tuned system right now. Um, and I think most of the, most of the, problem is on the VW side, and there are capabilities on the VW side to make some of these things run in parallel. Um, the way we did it, we just did it straightforward, simple, as simple as it goes, and it was, and it runs single-threaded, um, and you can, but you can parallelize some of the tasks on the VW side, so you can get it to go faster, definitely, and system tuning will help out. So, let's look at the IQ side. Yeah, so, I mean, this is just a basic system function of SPIQ table. So you can see the sort of three tables that were, or the two top tables that were created from a uh, from an analyst point of view. Believe me, these naming conventions with the forward slashes will make BW people feel at home. I was a bit horrified when I saw them, but uh, so so what it is that the top label is is the DSO, and I'm just gonna I've saved the C C corp because I've got clumsy fingers. But just do a quick uh, count star on that. Just when you're working in IQ, you can see because of the forward slashes, databases you know, don't really like that. You just put that in square brackets from a table name point of view, uh, and then you should be covered. So, and I can't even... Even, even properly, when you so pay, yeah. It's <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but the problem is, I don't want to go... That good old dial-up where it's just in slow-mo, so you're typing and you don't really know. Okay, that's yeah. the... Um, sorry, this is the wrong table. Let me just get out of that. This is live demo. So this is like the control table. This is the control table, so I'll just run that quickly. So those are the two events, if you come to the far right, what you're talking about. The, you know, there's the one year you ran, and then there's 1991, 1998, and the row counts that came in. So you've got 16,041,000,000 over there. So, you know, for me, this control table, I think, is quite an awesome thing. So what I mean by that, you could manage you could manage the flux of what's happening to your data coming in, coming out. Um, also, based on this, you could see how the database was growing um, from a capacity planning point of view. So, all in all, I'm very pleased that sort of this is all built in, and according to this, is pretty common in the in the sort of BW world. Yeah, it's. I mean, that's that's kind of the way BW tends to keep track of its of its info object or of its info provider requests as well, so that's where it, that's where the the idea came from, I'm sure. But um, yeah, it's a really useful little little control table to have. Okay, let me just get uh, is this is it ONZ FY DSO? I'm sorry, just ONZ, oh, let's just change the R with an N. There we go. Let's do a select star now. That's the data. I mean, it, normally with IQ, it cuts to the first 115 rows, so we don't have to worry about it. But it's as flat as you can get. This is sort of airline data. We haven't mentioned that. Um, but if you're familiar with our podcasts, you know we use them a lot. So, so what we've got here is I've just did a select star from, from the table. Um, it's a 60-odd million rows. I'll do a count now. But it's it's really, really flat sort of data store object data. Nothing, nothing aggregated, nothing cubed. Um, and I would suppose that you'd say it's the most, you know, the, the most unstructured to query out of. Um, but all the points we get really, really impressive, which which I'm very, very happy about. I'll just do a quick um, so we can see the row count, and we're looking at there we are 58 million rows worth of data. Cool. Okay. So that's 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 the the, the data store object we're coming from. Just uh, at the end, I'll show you what I did from an from an info cube point of view in IQ. It's irrelevant, but just want to show off what IQ can do. So do you want to? when we start looking at the queries from, from yeah. the BW point of view? Sure, let's do that. Um, uh, and I've got my stopwatch ready. Old all right. school. Yeah, because we, uh, <laughs> we need to use the stopwatch to, uh, to figure out how fast these things are running. No, it, we'll, we'll run some of the queries in debug mode um, and, okay. and just to show how fast they go. But So um, I, I cooked up several queries here, and basically what all these queries do Drill down by um, by year, by um, by calendar month, and then by carrier, by airline, um, just to show how many records we have for each of them, which roughly correlates to the number of flights. Um, so not a highly scientific test, but we just wanted to kind of put this thing through its paces and and see how it works. So if we do if we do a single year, um, just to get a feeling for how fast these things go, um, we can. We can take a look at the performance and 
it returns almost immediately. Now that was a query on the DSO. It was DSO in the year 1990. And so that data is stored entirely in IQ. Um, and, and so that's, that's a taste of what the performance is on, a, on aggregating a 5 million record um, slice of the IQ data. One year is roughly equivalent to 5 million to five million records. And if we go all the way down to the bottom, we can see the result row. Um, if you can see that, 3.1 second. Fingers were slow. Good, good. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so, so do yeah. you have the equivalent of an InfoCube um, sitting on BW for a year, if I recall yeah. correctly? Yeah, um, on a cube for 1990. Um, and this is a cube, uh, this is a BW, um, OLAP data structure. It's an extended star schema on the BW database. So it's an extended star schema sitting on the SQL server. Um, no aggregates, uh, no special indexing, although, the, although BW creates massive indexes for its info cubes to start out with. Um, and we're not using the new SQL server uh, columnar index capability either, uh, which I would expect to give similar performance to IQ. So let's look at how long that takes. Sorry, can you just say that again? Mm -hmm. the, the SQL server <laughs> columnar index server performance. Get, you said it's going to get similar performance to IQ. If, if, I, think, I think, well, this query runs about half as fast as the IQ query. Um, yeah. So it, this, this query took, if, if we timed it, about six or seven seconds. Um, and we can actually run that in debug mode and see. Um, what I said was that, that SQL server in the newest version in 2012 um, has a has a columnar index mode, which can replace its standard indexes. And that columnar index, I would, I would expect, since it's a columnar data structure, to have a similar type of performance to what you would see with IQ, um, probably in the same general range. But we're not using that here. We're just using pure, yeah. pure um, SQL Server extended star schema. And you can see that the read time um, for the database piece well, it's it's both the database and VW's aggregation um, internally was about eight and a half seconds. So it's maybe it's between two and three times slower um, than than the IQ only. Um, that becomes this becomes painfully clear if we do a query on everything on on the complete data set. Um, yeah. If we use IQ, think, sorry. What we also we also got to realize there, which is which is quite amazing, is that. IQ sitting on a different server somewhere at the, at the mercy of Amazon, really. Yeah. Um, and and right. we're still coming. And it's, you know, we looked at the data structures completely flat, still coming in half the time. Yeah, that's absolutely, that's absolutely a really good point, Clint, because normally in a BW, um, in a BW solution, what you're going to have is you're going to have the BW application server on one server and the database, the SQL server database, the Oracle database, whatever, on a different server. Um, and I, I do want to make clear that what we have here is on, on a single Amazon virtual server instance, we have the SQL server database and the BW application server. So there's no network yeah. there. Um, but the IQ server is on a different server. And so it is operating at a disadvantage. Um, and it's still, as far as we can see, running at least twice as fast for a lot of these queries. So what I just ran here is the query for every year showing carrier in month, aggregated by number of records. Um, you can see we have year 1987, 88, um, and so on. Um, 87 has less data than everything else. And just to take a look at the statistics, um, our query on the IQ side took 25 seconds. So that's for everything, um, which kind of makes sense. It's about, it, it scales more or less linearly. So the previous query took three, some, three dot some seconds. Um, this query is on, that was a single year, and now this query on uh, 11 or 12 years, I believe, is taking 25 seconds. So that's, that's about what we would expect. Um, I think, you know, when you, when you start working on, you know, IQ, it doesn't fall off the cliff when row-based databases typically do. You know, that'd be fine, but as, as you scale and as the volume right. gets up to the terabyte level, they literally just fall off a cliff where IQ will just keep, you know, keep going. So yeah, I mean, we're using a relatively tiny data set here, um, and right now I'm running the same query on all of the data on the cube data structure that's based on SQL Server, so the BW native cube-based data structure, what we normally do our BW reporting on. We'll see how fast that runs. But I think, I think Clint, you're exactly right. Like, the, 
we're going to start to see a really big advantage, a bigger advantage, I would expect, um, when we start using bigger data sets. So this data set is relatively puny. It's, it's you know, 40, 50 mm. million records. Um, and it's, it's, it's somewhere between 5 and 10 gigabytes of data, depending on how you're counting. Um, but once we get into data sets that are 100 or 1,000 or even 10,000 times bigger than that, um, IQ should really start to shine, um, whereas other databases may not even make it that far. So this was... I mean, something else. This no, was the, sorry, this, so to, uh, just to look at this really quickly, this was the BW um, native data structure, and the read time was 50 seconds. So IQ only on a DSO, um, 25 seconds. BW, 50 sec BW on a cube um, on SQL server, 50 seconds. So that's about 100%. The time is about 100% larger than, than um, running it on the IQ only. Now, normally with Nearline Storage, you're going to have part on the SQL server database and part on the IQ um, database. So you'll see something in between um, normally. But, but IQ is definitely giving us a pretty nice speed up here. It's not going to be slower, put it that way, which is key. <laughs> you, you, should, you should get a jump in performance just by using the solution. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's the key. Um, and so that's pretty much what I've got to show on the VW side. I, we just wanted to run through those queries really quickly and, and show that, you know, yeah, as, as you said, Ken, it's not going to be slower. So do you want to take a look at the, SQ, at the IQ server side? And, and there's just one more. I mean, I just just did a. So this is this is my understanding of BW limited as we know. But um, what I wanted to, to to run through quickly is just a, a my my understanding of what an info cube is. It's basically an aggregation of data on the DSO. Uh, is that pretty much right? I don't know, Ethan, if you can see the SQL statement that I've got going there. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think this I think this SQL statement is a good is a good approximation of the type of query that BW ran. Um, on the DSO, um, on the cube, it's going to be it's going to be uh, it, it's an extended star schema, so it ends up being yeah. a much more complex query. But on the IQ side, um, it will it will hopefully flatten the data, and um, you'll end up with something more like this. So so this is just running running the query. Um, I'm just what I'm doing here is I'm putting it into a temp table called report test. Um, if we can run that now, just remember this is going through what 58 million rows, doing group buys and a few things. I haven't touched any indexes here yeah, this side as well. Um, this is just my little show off of Sybase IQ really. Uh, should come around. You can see 13 seconds, and we've ended up with a total of sort of 1,500 rows, which is probably what would end up in your info cube at the end. That's about right. Yeah, that's what we would end up in the in the. Um it, it, it's what would be passed back to the OLAP, the BW OLAP engine um, from the database query, and then BW would convert that into the, the display that we actually saw. You in the wonderful position of having that data and having it sort of real time, you know? Yeah, it's 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 pretty impressive. Um, it's click of a button. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, I, I, and I. Go for it, sorry. It's much more interactive than um, it's much more interactive than we're accustomed to on a BW system running just purely on the database. Um, pretty much regardless of what that database is. Um, I mean, in BW for a while now, we've had various accelerators available. So we had the BW accelerator, and now we've got BW on HANA, um, and those those are great, and they really speed things up, and they became pretty much required. Um, this is kind of like uh, this is kind of like a like a version of VW Accelerator, where you you can move some of that data over to IQ, and you should get a nice speed up. Just something else that came to 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 mind from the you know the DBA perspective is 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 what your management of that system is. Because let's let's use round numbers. Let's say you've got a ten terabyte instance, you've got a monster. Um, you know, if you can move eight of those across to IQ, uh, hopefully get 100% compression. You're already down to you know, that eight's gone down to two or three terabytes. Uh, you know, you've only got two left. Suddenly you, you, you archive and you back up your DR is of half the environment, half the disk space, half the maintenance. You know, that, that also can add up. You know, I mean, some, some, some of the larger customers have seven-tier environments for some reason. 
but you know, you're suddenly dropping down terabytes of space, and that's another huge benefit, I think, as well. Yeah, absolutely, and I, and I think historically with BW um, systems have kind of have started to struggle a bit once they get into the once they get into the terabyte range, um, for especially for for single objects that are in the terabyte range, um, BW's management can, of those, of that data can begin to struggle a little bit because the databases just aren't necessarily up to the task. Um, and so moving some of that data to IQ, which is which is basically built to handle data in terabyte and up range, um, could really help out with that. Just just another question. What are the other archiving options for people if they don't want to put it to IQ from a, you know, is there sort of a, a, a sort of file server based archiving that can happen in BW? Or what do people typically do if they if their sort of environment bloats and that's it's too big to manage. Well, we can use traditional archiving where it's actually offline, basically. Um, but for other new line storage options, uh, basically there are other databases. So there's there's the Sand, um, also columnar yeah. storage database. Um, there's you can use DB2 uh, with new line storage, and IBM has lots of documentation on how you do that. Um, so there are some other options. Um, I'm not sure that there's anything that's going to be quite as integrated as what IQ looks like right now. Um, so SAP seems to be moving into this space a little bit, and and much like they did with HANA. And HANA is VW supports many databases, but HANA has a special position there, right? Um, it yeah. seems like now that SAP owns Sybase, uh, VW supports many databases for new line storage um, through many partners. But it seems like Sybase IQ may have now a bit of a special position. Cool. Um, any other closing thoughts? I'm just kind of excited about this. I mean, it 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 it, it potentially makes BW a lot more useful for a lot of um, scenarios, and not just BW on HANA ones. Because, as I said, BW historically has struggled a bit with large with larger data sets, and so this could really um, breathe new life into some BW systems that are struggling. Um, but it also makes the value proposition in BW on HANA potentially a lot better because you can um, have a lot more control over the size of your data set that you're actually going to be putting on the HANA. Yeah. I mean, that, that to me is the main, the, the big compelling reason. I mean, you could implement NLS like you now, even though the HANA is sort of two, three years in the pipeline for you. You know, what it's doing is creating the environment where your system, your hot, your you know your one day HANA database system is small enough, um, which is not. So it's you know it's this is an investment that's not going to be a waste. As you say, it's also you have the warm and funny see that your HANA HANA instance is just not going to blow up, and you keep sort of you know buying PWAs or cup 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 being by you know ramping up your HANA instance because of memory. Uh, one thing I don't know, and I, I don't sell software, so I don't know. But I mean, I'd, I'm, I'd hope and I'd love to know if SAP do sell a runtime instance of IQ for this. Um, you know, which would be very well priced. I know they've done that with the analytics edition in business objects, where if you're running IQ just under business objects, then it's you, I don't know, it's an eighth of the price. I'm not too sure what it is, but yeah, do you have, any, not, have you heard anything about pricing? No, I don't. I don't know anything about pricing. I I think it would definitely be in SAP's best interest to make this to kind of make customers an offer they can't refuse here, because um, because I think the more the more installations of IQ that SAP can get can get running, and the more people that they can get comfortable with that, um, and the more BWs they can get switched to a much more mature um, data management and, and hot hot to cold um, kind of full spectrum data aging approach. Um, the more customers will be ready to switch to BW on HANA when the time comes. So it's definitely an SAP's interest to get this out there um, and get this rolling. It's still pretty new, so I think they're being a little bit cautious about pushing it out as much as they as much as they could. Um, I, so I would expect them to continue to go slow for at least another few months. Um, but then I would hope that they really start to heat things up and try to get this into as many installations as possible. For sure. Okay. Well. Thanks so much. I think it's been it's something I've been blogging about and talking about for two years. So I'm pretty excited to see it working. And thanks for all the effort on your side with your new newborn, newish born daughter. And that's been uh, juggling. Ethan's been juggling continents and babies, continents and babies. So uh, 
thanks, thanks for all the effort. It's really appreciated. And yeah, uh, thank you. Yeah. And I hear you're juggling continents too. So uh, thanks for doing the <laughs> yeah. IQ setup and and doing the debugging on the uh, the database connection. Awesome. Thanks, Ethan. Thanks, everybody. Right. Thanks, Clint. This podcast is hosted and sponsored by Millie Technologies. Visit us on the net at SaveTheCMS.com. Dee Slayer!